Chapter 6, Natural Law, The Theory and Its Attractions. You are an animal. I'm not trying to insult you, just stating a fact. I am an animal too, and so is everyone else we know. The basic needs of animals, food, water, security, companionship, freedom from pain, are the basic needs of human beings. All humans, like every other animal, share the same fundamental plight, certain one day to die and vulnerable to harm in the meantime. Perhaps the key to morality lies in understanding our place in the natural order of things. Many have thought so. In trying to discover what makes for a good human life, we might take a cue from the rest of the animal kingdom and ask about why their lives go well when they do. It seems that there is a common answer. Animals live good lives when their nature is fulfilled, and bad lives when it isn't. A racehorse by nature is built for speed. English pointers are meant to aid in the hunt. Chameleons naturally blend in with their background. When fillies break a leg or chameleons cannot camouflage themselves, their lives go poorly. A good pointer will be able to track and give chase. A bad one will sit lazily and ignore nearby prey. In each of these cases, nature is dictating the terms of appraisal. The things in nature have a nature. Such things are bad when they are unnatural and good to the extent that they fulfill their nature. Perhaps we can say the same thing about human beings. That is the guiding thought of the natural law theory. By its lights, good human beings are those who fulfill their nature. Bad human beings are those who don't. The moral law is the natural law, the law that requires us to act in accordance with our nature. As we'll see, this is a different kind of natural law from the one that physicists use to describe the workings of molecules or galaxies. At its most basic, natural law theory tells us that actions are right just because they are natural, and wrong just because they are unnatural, and people are good or bad to the extent that they fulfill their true nature. The more they fulfill their true nature, the better they are. The natural law theory promises to solve some very serious problems in ethics. Four of these are especially important. 1. Natural law theory promises to explain how morality could possibly be objective, that is, how moral standards depend on something other than human opinion. According to this theory, human nature can serve as the objective standard of morality. We do right when our acts express human nature and do wrong when they violate it. Since individuals and entire societies can be mistaken about what our true nature is, they can be badly off target about what morality asks of us. Although many natural law theorists are theists who claim that our nature was given to us by God, that is not an essential element of the theory. What is crucial is that human nature is meant to serve as the ultimate moral standard. If this theory is correct, then so long as there is such a thing as human nature, there is an objective source of morality. 2. Natural law theory easily explains why morality is specially suited for human beings and not for anything else in the natural world. Almost everyone agrees that a distinctive human feature is our sophisticated reasoning abilities. A few other animals may be able to reason in basic ways, but no species on Earth can approach our ability to assess various ways of life, critically analyze the merits of actions and policies, and then govern our behavior on the basis of our reflections. This capacity for rational thought also seems to be the cornerstone of morality. Moral agents, those who bear responsibility for their actions and who are fit for praise or blame, are those who can control their behavior through reasoning. That's why we don't hold animals or trees or automobiles morally responsible for the harms they sometimes cause. Only human beings have the sort of nature that enables them to be moral agents. Natural law theory can thus explain why moral duties apply only to human beings, or if there are any, to other life forms who share our rational powers. 3. Natural law theory has a clear account of the origins of morality. The theory tells us that morality is only as old as humanity itself, that morality dates to the earliest days of humankind, but that isn't because morality depends on human opinion, as so many people believe. Rather, it is because morality depends on human nature. No humans, no human nature. No human nature, no morality. That's why there are no such things as eternal moral laws. 4. Natural law theory may solve one of the hardest problems in ethics, how to gain moral knowledge. There are many skeptical arguments that try to undermine hopes for moral wisdom. Here is a perennial favorite, a variation on an argument developed by the brilliant Scottish philosopher David Hume. Let's call this Hume's argument in his honor. 1. We can know only two sorts of claims, conceptual truths or empirical truths. 
Two, moral claims are neither conceptual truths nor empirical truths. Three, therefore, we can have no moral knowledge. A conceptual truth is one that can be known just by understanding it. Here are some conceptual truths. No sphere is a cube, all integers are even or odd, bachelors are unmarried males, if A is taller than B and B is taller than C, then A is taller than C. You can close your eyes to the world, just think about these claims and know that they are true. Empirical truths are not like this. They are known only by relying on evidence from our five senses. Here are some empirical truths. I live in a house that was built in 1915. It was raining in London on June 25, 2007. The Pacific Ocean is larger than the Atlantic. David Hume never married. Suppose we agree with the plausible claim that all knowledge is of either conceptual or empirical truths. If that is right, and if moral claims are neither, then moral knowledge is impossible. Why aren't moral claims conceptual truths? Because for any moral claim, we can completely understand it and still wonder whether it is true. That doesn't happen when we ask whether bachelors are unmarried or whether spheres are cubes. Anyone who really understands those questions already knows the answer. Why aren't moral claims empirical truths? Because we don't discover them by means of our senses. No amount of scientific probing into the world will reveal any moral features in it. If you witness a murder or a broken promise, you will notice many things, but you can't see its wrongness. Hume had a supporting reason for thinking that moral knowledge could not be empirical. Empirical knowledge tells us how to describe the world, and when we describe the world, we talk about what is the case. But morality speaks of what ought to be the case. How can we get from descriptions to prescriptions? How does knowing how the world actually works enable us to learn how it ought to work. Hume thought that there was no answer to this question. If he is right, there is a gap between what is and what ought to be, a gap that can never be crossed. Suppose we describe an act in the following terms. The act was an instance of a painful killing. The victim was a child. The child was terrified. The killer picked his victim because the child was an easy target. The killer felt no remorse. If Hume is right, then no matter the number of descriptions we pile on, logic will never tell us which moral conclusion to draw from this evidence. Of course, we think that this act is immoral, but the claim that such a killing is immoral cannot be established by empirical evidence, nor can conceptual truths establish it. Since all evidence must take one form or the other, it follows that we can never be justified in our moral views. Natural law theory claims to be able to solve Hume's challenge. According to the theory, moral knowledge requires two things. We must know what our human nature is and know whether various actions fulfill it. Natural law theorists think that both kinds of knowledge are empirical. Human beings are part of the animal kingdom. We learn the true nature of other animals by careful scientific study, and the same holds for human beings. Discovering the essence of human nature is a scientific enterprise. Armed with this empirical knowledge, we can then look carefully at individuals to see whether their actions line up with human nature. This careful examination is empirical too. Suppose, for instance, that we perform a vast study of human infants across many different cultures and discover that they are gentle and nonviolent. Many have thought that this sort of empirical evidence clinches the case for thinking that these traits are part of human nature. If we then see people acting aggressively and violently, we have all the evidence we need to convict them of immorality. That's because they would be acting in conflict with their true nature. So, on the natural law view, gaining moral knowledge need not be mysterious. Armed solely with descriptions of a person's behavior and knowledge of our human nature, we can determine whether actions are moral by seeing whether they fulfill our nature. If natural law theorists are right, you really can derive an ought from an is. Three conceptions of human nature. We often approve of actions by declaring them to be perfectly natural or excuse someone's harmful conduct by saying that it was the natural thing to do under the circumstances. We also condemn certain actions as unnatural or say of an especially awful act that it was a crime against nature. This all makes excellent sense on the assumption that the natural law theory is true. In order to apply the natural law theory to real moral problems, we need a sharp understanding of human nature, for it is human nature that, on this theory, will determine the standards of morality. Human nature is what makes us humans. It is the set of features that is essential to being human, so that if we were to lose these features, we would also lose our humanity. Natural law theorists are committed to the idea that there is a human essence, a set of traits that define us as human beings. What is the nature of human nature? Here are three familiar and problematic answers. 
Human nature as animal nature. On one understanding, we are animals by nature, and so to act according to our nature is just to behave as other animals do. Other animals need protection against predators and enough food to eat, and this explains why it is morally acceptable for us to defend ourselves against attackers and to grow food and feed ourselves. That certainly sounds plausible, but looking to other animals for moral guidance is actually quite a poor idea. We've already seen a brief discussion of this in the introduction where I criticized an argument for meat-eating that tried to justify that practice by claiming that animals eat other animals. Leave aside the fact that most animals we eat do not eat other animals. Uh, even when it comes to true carnivores, the fact that an animal kills and eats another animal does not give us moral license to do the same. After all, some animals kill their own young, others eat their own young. Still, others engage in real brutality that targets the weaker members of their own species species. That doesn't make it right for us to do any of these things. So the fact that we share many traits, needs, and interests with other animals is not going to unlock the puzzle of determining our human nature. At least if that nature is supposed to also provide moral standards that we must live by. We need to look elsewhere for an understanding of human nature that might be morally relevant. Human nature is what is innate. Innate traits are ones we have from birth. They are natural in the sense of being inborn, natural as opposed to being learned or acquired from parents and society. On this line of thinking, our true nature is the one we are born with. Traits we acquire through socialization are artificial and stain the purity of our earliest days. In principle, we can use scientific methods to discover what is innately human and so solve Hume's challenge to gaining moral knowledge. If Jean-Jacques Rousseau was right, we are innately angelic. Before society corrupts us, our noble nature shines through. We are, by nature, pleasant, cooperative, and considerate. If our nature holds the key to morality, then morality is largely as we think it is. It requires us to be kind, cooperative, and attentive to the needs of others. That would be a comfort, but what if Thomas Hobbes had it right? He thought that we are innately selfish, competitive, and distrustful. We are born that way and, for the most part, stay that way. If the natural is the innate, and if we are required to act on our true nature, then the Habesian view is going to force us to abandon many of our conventional ethical beliefs. The view that the natural is what is innate is widely held. This explains why so many people think that studies focused on infants will unlock the key to human nature. The thought is that society is bound to change our natural state, and so we gain the deepest insight into human nature by discovering what we are like before society changes us in so many ways. Yet if natural law theory is correct, and if the natural is the very same thing as the innate, then we need to resolve the nature nature nurture debate before we can know what is right and wrong. And that seems mistaken. We are very confident that morality is not a council of selfishness, mistrust, and competition, even if we are uncertain about whether such traits are innate. We can be very sure that killing people because of their skin color is immoral, even if we aren't sure whether we have an innate tendency to harm people who don't look like us. This raises a general point. The ultimate origins of our impulses are irrelevant to the morality of our actions. Rape and robbery are immoral, no matter whether the impulse to commit these crimes is innate or acquired. Cheerfully comforting the sick is a good thing, even if we weren't born with a desire to offer such help. Since the morality of our actions and our character traits does not depend on whether they are innate or acquired, natural law theorists must look elsewhere for an understanding of human nature. Human nature is what all humans have in common. Many people think that our nature is whatever traits we all share. These universal human features would make up the essence of humanity. Such a view lets us scientifically determine our human nature. The data wouldn't always be easy to come by, but with a lot of effort, we could discover the essence of human nature just by observing the features that all humans have in common. There are two problems with such a view. First, there may be no universal human traits. And second, even if there are, they may not provide good moral guidance. It may seem silly to deny that there are any universal human traits. Doesn't everyone want to have enough food and water to remain alive? Don't all adults have a sex drive? Aren't we all capable, to one degree or another, of complex thinking about our future? Yet some people want to die, not to live. Others are indifferent to the attractions of sex. Still others are so mentally impaired as to be unable to think at all about their future. For just about any trait, perhaps every trait, 
that is said to be part of human nature, we can find exceptions that undermine the rule. Natural law theorists have a reply to this, which is best appreciated by considering an example. Return to the case of non-human animals and think about their nature. For instance, it is part of a buck's nature to be alert to predators, to have four legs, to grow antlers, and to be fawn-colored. Still, there are bucks with only three legs. A few fail to grow antlers, others are deaf to predators, still others are albinos. We might say of such specimens that they aren't really bucks, not fully bucks, or not all that a buck should be. If that sounds right, then we might adopt the following strategy. Perhaps human nature, like that of non-human animals, is determined not by what every member of the species shares, but only what most members share. Bucks can have a nature, even if some bucks fail to perfectly live up to it. The same goes for human beings. This strategy won't work. There is the difficult problem of setting a threshold. Just how many humans need to have a trait before it qualifies as part of human nature? Believe that aside, the real problem is this. The fact that most humans have a certain trait is morally irrelevant. Suppose, for instance, that most of us are selfish and mean. On this line of thinking, being selfish and mean would then be part of human nature. That would make such behavior morally right on the natural law view. But that's awfully difficult to accept. Even if everyone or most of us were cruel and malicious, that would not make cruelty and malice morally good. Even if people were ordinarily, usually, or typically nasty and petty, these traits would still be vices, not virtues. The fact that many, most, or all people behave a certain way or have certain character traits is not enough to show that such behaviors and traits are morally good. The line from is to ought cannot be crossed so easily. Natural purposes. If human nature is not a matter of the innate traits that all or most of us have, then what is it? The answer given by most natural law theorists is this. Human nature is what we are designed to be and to do. It is some function of ours, some purpose that we are meant to serve, some end that we were designed for. It may seem that this conception of human nature places us squarely outside the realm of science and in the domain of religion. How could science tell us what our purpose is? Doesn't talk of being designed for something imply the existence of an intelligent designer? In fact, many natural law theorists have made these assumptions and have developed their views within the context of one religious tradition or another. On these views, God is our intelligent designer. When God created us, he assigned us a specific set of purposes. These are what make up our human nature. Since God is all good, frustrating God's purpose is immoral. That's what we do when we act unnaturally. That's why it is wrong to act unnaturally. There is a lot to say about such a view, but most of it has already been said in the previous chapter. On the present account, we must act naturally because that is the way we respect God's plans for us, which are at the heart of morality. Though this isn't quite the same thing as making God's commands the basis of morality, it is close enough to have inherited most of the strengths and weaknesses of the divine command theory. Rather than revisit that topic, let's consider a secular interpretation of natural purposes. The challenge is to make sense of the idea that we have been designed to serve some purpose without having to invoke an intelligent designer. Strictly speaking, of course, nature has no designs for us. Nature is not an intelligent being with intentions and plans. Still, it can make sense to speak of something's natural function or purpose. The mechanisms of evolution and natural selection, rather than God, can serve as the source of our natural purposes. For instance, nature designed our brains to enable us to think, our liver to detoxify our blood, and our pancreas to regulate glucose levels. We can say what mitochondria are for, what the heart and kidneys are meant to do. In each case, there is a purpose that these organs serve, even if no one assigned them this purpose. But that sort of talk doesn't easily translate to human lives. What is a human being for? Does the question even make sense? To answer this question, we need to understand the idea of a natural purpose. Two basic secular accounts might offer some insight. Call the first account the efficiency model and the second the fitness model. Consider the efficiency model. Sticking with the example of a heart, we can say that pumping blood is its natural purpose, because nothing pumps blood as well as a heart. Hearts have a certain structure that enables them to pump blood more efficiently than anything else in the body. That is why the purpose of a heart is to pump blood. 
Human beings can have a function or a purpose, then, if we are more efficient than anything else when it comes to certain tasks. Well, we are, but there are so many of them. For instance, we are better than anything else at designing puzzles and writing essays. But on this model, natural law theory cannot be correct, given its claim that unnatural action is immoral. For that would mean that we act immorally whenever we are bad at puzzle design or essay writing. We are also far better at building weapons than any other animal, and far more talented at using instruments of torture. But if acting naturally is always morally acceptable, then these actions, if they really are among our natural purposes, are beyond reproach. Something has gone wrong. If the efficiency model is correct, if human nature is given by our natural purposes, and these purposes are whatever we are best able to accomplish, the natural law theory must fail. There are too many such purposes, and many have nothing moral about them. Perhaps the fitness model will do better. On this account, our organs have the purposes they do because it is extremely adaptive for them to serve these roles. The natural purpose of the heart, brain, liver, and lungs is to do what enhances fitness fitness, roughly our success at survival and reproduction. We are able to survive and pass on our genes to our offspring only because these organs function as well as they do. Nature has designed hearts and kidneys and brains, etc., to improve our chances of survival. This is their natural purpose. It is ours, too. We are meant to survive and to transmit our genes to the next generation. That is what a human life is for. In a godless world, that is all the purpose our lives can have. Since our natural purposes are survival and procreation, we can see why so many natural law theorists have thought suicide immoral and have condemned birth control and homosexual activity. We also have a ready explanation of why courage, endurance, and fortitude are true virtues. Those who possess them are, in the relevant sense, fitter than those who don't. Suppose that the natural law theory is true, and suppose that we fulfill our human nature just when we fulfill our natural purposes. Two things follow. One, acting naturally, fulfilling our natural purposes, is always moral. Two, acting unnaturally, frustrating our natural purposes, is always immoral. But if the fitness model is correct, then both claims are false. Claim one is false. To see this, recall that natural actions are those in which we use our mind and body to satisfy the purposes they were designed for. In the fitness model, these purposes are survival and reproduction. So natural actions are those that increase the chances of our survival and reproduction. But men can increase the chances of passing on their genes by raping as many women as they can. That is about as immoral as anything I can think of. And survival? Consider the words of Primo Levi, an Auschwitz prisoner. The worse, that is, the fittest survived. The best all died. Sometimes those best schooled in violence and treachery are the ones likeliest to live another day. If we understand natural purposes as the fitness model advises, then claim one is false. Claim two is also false. Not every act that frustrates a natural purpose is immoral. Nature has engineered our ears to be capable of hearing, the better to detect predators, to listen to the advice of our allies, to hear the threats posed by our attackers. But there is nothing immoral about wearing a set of headphones that block out noise. We have eyes so that we can see, but there is nothing wrong with crossing your eyes to make a joke or closing them to shut out an unwanted sight. It is worth noting that these examples can be successful even if it is God and not nature alone that has endowed us with these various purposes. Suppose that God made eyes to see, ears to hear. Still, isn't it morally acceptable to put on blindfolds or wear headphones? Despite being unnatural, these actions are perfectly acceptable. What this shows is that the fitness model is as vulnerable as the efficiency model. Neither gives us a solid understanding of what human nature is. Until we are given a better method of determining our nature, the natural law theory is in trouble. The weakness of the various understandings of human nature allows us to see why a classic moral argument fails. That argument, call it the natural law argument, goes like this. 1. If an act is unnatural, then it is immoral. 2. Suicide, contraception, and homosexual activity are unnatural. 3. Therefore, suicide, contraception, and homosexual activity are immoral. The first premise is false on all of the interpretations we have so far considered. Whether unnatural actions spring from acquired traits rather than innate ones, whether they are rare or unusual rather than typical or even universal, whether they frustrate nature's purposes rather than conform to them, still, such actions can be morally acceptable. 
this does not prove that suicide, contraception, and homosexual activity are morally okay. What it shows, however, is that this popular argument is highly suspect and will certainly fail unless we have a better understanding of human nature to rely on. The argument from humanity. This may be a good time to consider another famous argument of the natural law tradition, the argument from humanity. This is perhaps the most widely heard anti-abortion argument in public debates on the subject. The argument is straightforward. 1. It is always wrong to deliberately kill an innocent human being. 2. A fetus is an innocent human being. 3. Therefore, it is always wrong to deliberately kill a fetus. A great deal could be said about that first premise, but let's leave it aside for the moment and focus on the second. It seems clearly true to a great many people, and it seems just as clearly false to many others. What is going on here? The explanation, I think, is that the term human being is ambiguous. It has more than one meaning. There are at least two senses of the term used in these debates, and members of each camp tend to use their preferred meaning. The result is that a lot of the discussions about the morality of abortion end up going nowhere. For our purposes, the important question is whether a fetus is an innocent human being, and that depends on how we define humanity. What is the essence of humanity? It is tempting, of course, to look to science for an answer. It tells us that being a member of the species Homo sapiens is the essence of humanity. On this biological account, premise two is clearly true, since fetuses of our species are clearly innocent of any wrongdoing. But if we give a purely scientific definition of humanity, then premise one begs the question against pro-choice opponents. In other words, premise one assumes the truth of the conclusion it is meant to support. It does not provide an independent reason for rejecting the pro-choice position. Those who advance premise one without any supporting argument for it are preaching to the choir, since only those who already oppose abortion will accept the first premise. If humanity is defined in purely biological terms, then the first premise needs a lot of defense. Indeed, as much defense as the argument's conclusion. Alternatively, we might think of humanity not as a biological category, but rather a moral one. On such a view, to be human is to have a certain moral status. It is to be entitled to a broad set of moral rights, including the right to life. On this reading, premise one may well be true, though some critics will argue that even this moral rule has some exceptions. We consider this matter in some detail in the chapters to come. Uh, still, even if premise one turns out to be true, the second premise, the one that grants fetuses a wide range of basic rights, just as clearly begs the question. It needs as much defense as the conclusion it is meant to support. So the term humanity, like the term natural, is ambiguous. This isn't any kind of problem so long as we are very clear about which meaning we are relying on. But once we are clear about its different meanings and make sure that the same meaning is being used for both premises, we can see that the argument is bound to beg the question. What this shows is that the argument cannot stand alone. Depending on which meaning of human we use, opponents of abortion will have to provide a strong supplemental argument to defend premise one, premise two, or both. There are lots of cases like this. Here is another example from a newspaper article I read just this morning. 1. It is morally okay to play sports. 2. Dogfighting is a sport. 3. Therefore, dogfighting is morally okay. This argument was given by a friend of Michael Vick, the star quarterback who pled guilty to criminal charges related to his role in running dogfights. Before you had a look at this one, you might not have realized that people have different definitions of sport but they do. Some people think of a sport as any skill-based athletic competition, others think of it as any recreational activity. Still, others consider sports to have essentially character-building and morally uplifting aspects, so that a gladiator contest, for instance, or professional wrestling doesn't qualify as a true sport. None of these definitions is uniquely correct. The term sport is also ambiguous, and that's okay. It's a terribly impoverished language that can't make room for ambiguity. But when we examine a line of argument that contains an ambiguous term, we must first settle on the definition we will use and then stick with it. Only then can we test each premise to see whether it turns out to be true. When we do that with the dogfighting argument, we can see that those who think that sports are essentially character building will accept the first premise, but likely reject the second. And those whose definitions make no reference to morality may accept the second premise, but then when they think about so-called blood sports, cast a suspicious eye on the first. The same pattern that we saw in the argument from humanity repeats itself here and in so many other contexts.
There is a basic philosophical point here. You can't solve complex moral problems with definitions alone. You can't solve the abortion debate just by defining a human being in terms of species membership, nor can you solve it if you define human being as a person possessed of basic moral rights. We can define humanity in any way we like by reference to species, genetic code, moral rights, rationality, self-awareness, linguistic ability, or in any of a dozen other ways. But no matter what definition we come up with, there is no shortcut through a lot of further complicated moral argumentation. Definitions alone will never spare us the hard philosophical work it takes to solve complex moral problems. There is no better contemporary illustration of this point than the marriage argument given by many natural law theorists and other opponents of same-sex marriage. 1. Marriage is defined as a relation between a man and a woman. 2. Homosexual relations are between a man and a man, or a woman and a woman. 3. Therefore, homosexual relations can never qualify as a marriage. The search for a definition is the search for an essence. For instance, defining bachelors as unmarried adult males is supplying the essence, the central nature of being a bachelor. Is marriage essentially a relation between those of opposite sexes as defenders of the argument claim, or is its essence the expression of mutual love, honor, and commitment as supporters of same-sex marriage assert, or something else entirely? I won't try to settle this debate here, but the point raised earlier applies to this argument as well. The real question behind today's debates about same-sex marriage is whether the state is morally required to give the same legal rights to homosexual couples that it now gives to heterosexuals. That question cannot be settled by setting forth a definition, especially one that will appeal only to those on one side of the debate. It can be settled only by examining the ultimate point of marriage, the morality of homosexuality, the proper role of the state, and other difficult matters. Definitions are tools for thinking clearly. They clarify the subject matter and tell everyone precisely what the focus of discussion is. But having a subject firmly in mind is one thing. Determining its moral status is quite another. Definitions alone will never solve a moral problem. While this does not undermine the natural law theory, it must make us very careful of how we employ it. Even if we agree on a definition of human nature, and so on, what is essential to being human, there is great deal to do. Indeed, there is almost everything yet to do before we can draw important moral lessons about how to live our lives. Conclusion the deep appeal of the natural law theory is its promise to base morality on something clear and unmysterious, nature and its workings. Moral laws on this account are just natural laws, though ones that regulate human beings rather than planets, molecules, or gravitational forces. But as we have seen, it is difficult to try to read off recommendations for how we ought to act from descriptions of how nature actually operates. And that shouldn't be too surprising. Natural laws describe and predict how things will behave. They summarize the actual behavior of things, and unless they are statistical laws of the sort that assign a probability to outcomes rather than a certainty, they cannot be broken. Moral laws are different in every respect. They can be broken, and often are. They are not meant to describe how we actually behave, but rather to serve as ideals that we ought to aim for. Nor are they designed to predict our actions, since we often fall short of meeting the standards they set. Nature can define the limit of our possibilities. Our nature does not allow us to leap tall buildings in a single bound or to hold our breath for hours at a time. On the assumption that morality does not demand the impossible of us, nature can in this way set the outer bounds of what morality can require, but it can do no more. It cannot, in particular, tell us what we are required to do, nor can it tell us what we are forbidden from trying to achieve. Nature has, at best, only a limited role to play in moral theory.